Hi, everyone. We are here today with another episode of Love, Laughs, and Lessons. And we are into our Let's Talk About Sex, Baby series. We have another amazing guest who we'll int introduce momentarily. But I want to thank folks for tuning in again. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Denise. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. We are thrilled to welcome Anastasia, a distinguished Shibari artist and the visionary behind Voodoo Ropes to our upcoming episode to this new series, I should say. Um, so Anastasia has seven years of rich experience in the realm of Shibari. Anastasia has captivated audiences internationally through her teaching, exhibitions and performances. She views rope as a powerful medium for communication, self-expression, and meditation. And she's celebrating Shibari as an art of caring and connection. So Anastasia is the creative force, like I said, behind Voodoo Ropes. And she organizes these immersive retreats in the Mexican jungle. So we're excited to hear all about that. And these retreats have garnered a global following, offering participants a deep dive into the world of Shibari, intertwined with the vibrant local culture and spiritual ceremonies. So based in Playa del Carmen, she's fostering a, th a thriving open-minded community holding weekly classes and events that explore the non-sexual artistic side of Shibari. Anastasia aims to re redefine Shibari, liking it to a yoga practice that opens up new paths for empowerment and enrichment in life. So Anastasia, welcome. We are like super excited to hear about Shibari, how you got into it, and like just everything. I want to know it all. I was fascinated with that documentary. I'm just going to tell you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk about it with you. Yeah. Well, so what do you want to start from? Oh, anywhere. Anywhere. Like how did you find, what led you to Shibari? And then ultimately to finding Voodoo Ropes. Okay. Well, to Shibari, um, I got to Shibari through just studying Japanese language because I studied Japanese in the university. That was my major, Jap Japanese and political science. And then on one of the history classes, I saw the scroll which tied up people. And I was like asking my teacher, what's that? Why are they tied up? And why is this so pretty? And he was like, oh, I'll just send you an email. <laughs> and he sent me an email with uh, some interesting literature on the topic. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And I never heard about that before. I mean, I've seen some shibari in the particular type of movies, you know, but I never really uh, paid a lot of attention to it. And it never um, made me curious. I just knew that it exists. But then when I saw that this actually has more of like a deeper historical meaning and it goes from like one art to another and then how people can use it for relaxing and uh, feeling very, very meditative, I was like, whoa, this is very, very interesting. And I read a lot about it. And then I started trying with some friends and I didn't really know what I was doing exactly because there was no not many classes around and even on the internet when you google not much stuff comes up as a tutorial so I was just like finding the way but now I know that there are better ways to do that but yeah back then that was how I started and it was very very experimental but definitely showed me that the process of tying is making me feel very good and that it is all about the modals. So when you tie somebody, they are the, the main person there. So of course it makes me very calm and concentrated, but everything that I did was to make them feel beautiful and uh, again, relaxed. <laughs> That's so interesting. So, so the rope tying in itself is about the person that you're tying, but there's an extra benefit from the person who's doing the tying, is that what you're saying? Yes, I think yeah. that okay. definitely is. It works both ways, yeah. 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 So I'm not that familiar, this is so interesting. Yeah, so this is, it's more of a, a, a meditative yogic practice than a sexual practice or a combination or what, give it, yeah. 
Well, uh, this comes from a sexual practice. So shibari comes from actually the martial art of Hojo Jutsu for, of capturing prisoners, but we don't use it like that, obviously. We take the knots, they, they change it into more comfortable ones, and then we, they use it, especially in Japan, it's more of a sexual practice. Uh, of course, it can be used in many, many different ways. And it's the same knots and ties that people learn, and uh, they are I mean, free to use them in any way they want. This is why now there's so many different types of shibari and mm -hmm. different approaches to it. But yeah, so it's, uh, of course, if you give it like a good Googling, it will show you mostly the BDSM and the sexual parts of it. But there's more to it. There's not just that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there pain involved in it? Well, for some people there is and they enjoy it. So, but there's no pain involved uh, unless a person wants to have it. Yeah, so this is not really about torturing anybody. It's about like, mm -hmm. if people do the torturing, there is the type of shibari that is about that, but that's consensual. And that's because the other person gets benefits from the feeling of it. But yeah, that's very really far from my style. I don't torture people. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just use the knots and ties for the beauty of them and for the meditative part. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So, so how how long does this like <clears throat> process work? Is it like a yeah, like like a session? You mean yeah. like is there a session? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, well, it really depends on the person because uh, sometimes if it is just a shibari session for a person to feel a little more confident or like to relax and, you know, it's like a, it's like a weird type of a massage, I'd say. <laughs> um, that can be 30 minutes, can be more than 30 minutes. Sometimes if I do a, a little demo, demo, of that it can be like 10 15 but of course in 10 15 you can't fully um like relax into the ropes we need at least half an hour so model starts really melting into the ropes because you got to not just do one tie for a session it's usually dynamic tying that for example hands are tied first in a position of hug then we change the position to something like this with hands in the back and then we might uh, tie a leg to it. We might tie a person into a more open or a more closed position, depending on how they feel. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you need to be very careful of like uh, not to hurt anybody, of course, and also see their reactions to things. And mm -hmm. this is, I think, the hardest to actually tell what will be good for this person if they don't tell you exactly what they want. But always the session starts from people like saying how they want to feel. And sometimes some people even know the exact positions they want to be in, uh, which is extremely helpful, but that's very rare. <laughs> yeah. so, but for a photo session, it's just one knot. And that can take me for, from 10 minutes to like 20 minutes to tie, because that's usually a more complicated tie that's for the visual of it, you know? You said melting into it. Can mm. you can you tell us and tell the audience what that means? Yeah, so that is um, it's quite a great feeling actually. So when you are tied in rope really tightly and you can completely relax, but your body is going to stay in the position. So you don't have to do anything to make yourself stay in the position. You can just fully relax. And you will feel that the ropes are very comforting on the body. And this is what I call melting into the ropes. Okay. Okay. So you really this have to try. Like, yeah. <laughs> I heard you say tie, my, tie your hands together behind your back, your head. So it's like, yeah, there's got to be trust. There's a lot of trust involved. Yeah, of course. This cannot be done without trust because uh, people, People who come to shibari sessions, they don't go to a random person who ties. They always go to a person that they feel more or less connected to. And 
before any time there is some talking done and if you don't feel the right energy you shouldn't do it right yeah, yeah. yeah. Who are those people that would come to a Shibari session? Like, what are they looking for? Like what, you know, share the benefits, right? How do yeah. people even incorporate this into like their lifestyle? Cause I'm like, I'm totally fascinated. So I'll be looking to <laughs> learn more. Denise might be your first client. You're not your first, you might be <laughs> Denise's first experience of being <laughs> meditative, oh. tying up. Hi. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is exciting. Okay. Well, so people who come to me personally are usually the ones that found out about Shibari recently and that don't want to get into the sexual type of it and want to try to really feel connected to themselves and get this experience of completely like a hundred percent relaxation when you are disconnected from the world when you can switch off your mind hopefully <laughs> and then they email me they come for a session and we do some tying together and mm -hmm. yeah this usually results into them being calmer and feeling better just feeling better in their body so that is i can't say that there's an actual like type of person that would go but for the sessions like the sessions plus classes i have a lot of couples who come and some couples want to get tied together which is really nice yes. too but yeah. that's like here especially we need a lot of ac because if i tie somebody together in this temperature it's quite difficult but <laughs> mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. all inside, everything is comfortable, then people do really enjoy that. And where's here? Where are you? Oh, yeah. Well, I am in Mexico, Playa del Carmen. Okay. So you're actually yeah. there full time. Yeah, I live here. Yeah. Okay. So your <laughs> clients, do they fly in to work with you? Yeah, they usually fly in. Yeah. For the retreats, but for the like classes, usually people just fly to Mexico or to this area and then they start Googling and they find me. And they find you. Once they're there, then they, they find you. Yeah, That's most so, it's so interesting. Yeah. I had a couple of people who flew in for the photo sessions because they really mm -hmm. wanted to have the sessions in like my style. And that was very flattering to me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, usually this is the ones who are already here. And so tell us about, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, is, do people call you practitioner? Uh, call me practitioner. What do you mean? Are What's you like a Shibari practitioner? A Shibari, Shibari expert, Shibari consultant? Like Oh, like the, the, the name, the word of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a Shibari artist. Oh, oh okay. okay. Uh, yeah, because some, I mean, obviously my students would call me a Shibari teacher yeah. or as they sometimes say a sensei, but I'm not Japanese, but they just like the Japanese word sensei. So sometimes that comes out. Uh, but yeah, I prefer to just call myself a Shibari artist <laughs> Okay. without any extra to it because I consider myself an artist and I do teach and I love teaching but my my favorite part is creating uh, mm. things with ropes and creating the photos creating the events like curating all this stuff with rope <laughs> tell us about the photos because I saw this kind of rope bikini thing right <gasps> I shouldn't call it up but it was like a bikini and it had the most fabulous knots and then the bottom, and then I was like, whoa, that that's that was gorgeous. I was fascinated. Thank you. Well, um, uh, here in Mexico, actually, the art of macrame is very, very famous. And uh yes. like it's the macrame here is amazing, it's very beautiful. But the shibari, like what I do for photos, some people do want to have something macrame-ish, but okay. I don't do macrame. Macrame is like a hundred times harder than shibari, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but I use the shibari knots to create something similar, but mm -hmm. that will actually hold the body, especially for the, for example, a bra. It needs to be quite tight to hold everything. 
Right. Uh, so we work with that and I do it just for one time. So you can't reuse it, uh, right. whatever I do for photos. And it's personally made for one person. And then we tie it, take pictures, untie it or something like that. And it always depends on the person. Some people want photos in a more restrained position. Some want just the beauty photos where it's just an outfit made of rope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And there's hanging photos as well, yes? Mm, of I do a little bit of the suspension photography, but not much. I usually okay. do more of the uh, natural look. So like it's people in rope with some intricate knots, but they are outside somewhere in nature or in the city. It, again, it depends on the person because I try to connect the person, their story. This rope is literally a very good tool of connection that can be shown on the photos too. And uh, yeah, this is why I incorporate the rope a lot into the photos. It just helps to tell the story about the person. <laughs> So can you can you create a scene like give us an idea give the listeners and even I'm thinking well what is it trying to envision this imagine what what this looks like um to engage with you not necessarily in a photo shoot but the actual meditative tying up process are you leading them through a journey like give us an idea of what that would look like is it an hour session and what does it look like Okay so if it is a session for rope then we usually start with me giving them a couple of knots to learn because it is very important for me that people understand how some things are done and they try it by themselves. So first they learn a couple of knots and uh, they feel it on their body. They see if they even like it or not, because if you've never done it before, it's very important to give it a try and to do it yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> you are the person that you're supposed to trust the most, right? So yeah, um, do that first. And then we do, we use those simple knots to tie a meditative tie. So I try to help them through the journey of actually tying something a little bit more complicated on themselves. And if I see that they're ready to actually enjoy the process, then we do that. We use some breathing while tying. And uh, I use the technique of four elements that I learned from the Ukrainian artist, Tati Limati. She's amazing, one of my teachers of uh, elements of nature. And uh, I try to incorporate that into tying. So people feel, um, for example, I could be a little bit further. I could just go around them and give them a little bit, a little feeling of me, of my presence, but it's mostly them concentrating on themselves. Or I could be really close to them, flowing all over with the hugs and with more contact. But it really depends on the person because I need to see if they're ready for more contact or they're not so maybe they would prefer just to feel the rope on the body and not to really feel that much of me all over them you know so mm -hmm. that and then when a person feels really relaxed we usually move them so like I move them around a bit I can pull on the ropes I can push on the body a bit so they can feel the earthy touch and then we slowly get untied <laughs> and then have a little conversation, a little tea, so they can share what they felt if they want to. And mm -hmm. pretty much it. <laughs> some people do want some photos of the process, but that usually doesn't happen if it's just a session for the re relaxing. Do ever people have like um, a surprising reaction to the experience where they get emotional or... Yes, yeah, so sometimes people start laughing, really like like crazy laughing, <laughs> which is which is great. So I've seen people laugh, I see I've seen people cry, and it all usually comes out sometimes in the middle of the session when you are the most tied up. Mm -hmm. And when I give them this time to feel through the ropes, so they try to like move the body a little bit and then relax and then a lot of emotions come out. Uh, that is a very, that's really interesting that this release is happening when mm. you are the most tied. Because I think this is when when they feel the most safe and yes. 
when you can surrender more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like mm -hmm. it's a cathartic experience. Yeah. If you can allow yourself to really relax and um, lean into it, really. If you can allow yourself, exactly, because sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes people are expecting a very big like outcome from the session, but it doesn't always happen because it's it's a lot of it is in your head. Because yes, tying and touching all of those things are very impactful. But if you are not ready to surrender to this, I am not a magician, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It yeah. needs to be mutual we need to be mutually ready for this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's like uh yeah I agree it's in order for it to be as fulfilling as possible I think it's got to be a mutual experience of yeah. yeah you're not just offering up your expertise and your support and your guidance but also the participant needs to be willing to surrender themselves to the process and trust in you and sometimes mm -hmm. that can take a bit for people I think to build that comfort mm -hmm. and relax into it I imagine. And, and do people come back for multiple sessions? Like, some people is, do. Yeah. yeah, some people do come back for multiple sessions, but those are usually my friends who want to <laughs> get relaxed more and more because that's, yeah. a lot of people here, unfortunately, they come for a week and they leave. So mm. I don't see a lot of people very often, but I definitely see a lot of people coming back for like classes Okay. But sessions, people come to learn more and then they, if, especially if they learn together with their couple, they start trying it by themselves, which I really love that they get in this into their life by themselves. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty how, interesting. How do people, like, how would they even, like, I don't feel like this, so many people even know about it. It's not very big, but it's growing very fast, actually. It's becoming more and more mainstream now. So you can see Shibari at even many events that you might not expect to see it on the festivals, too. So it's more exposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's and if originally it was like a form of torture, how did you take it to something different? Like what? Was it because of the teacher that you had was doing something different? Like why for you, you know, is it is it not as sexual? And you saw this this art form because it is a beautiful art form and, and figured out that this is a way that I can apply this that would benefit people in this in a different way. Well, I was not I, I was definitely not the first person to take it to this way. Okay. But um, I did have the, so the guy that I consider my first teacher is the Japanese artist Hajime Kinoko. And uh, I learned through his videos and then I came to Japan and took real classes. And I've mm -hmm. always in, was inspired by his work that he incorporates rope into like giant rope installations that connect the person to the environment pretty mm -hmm. much. And I was very inspired to use the rope as a tool of connection too, but I didn't, I wasn't sure how exactly I'm going to do that. And then when I was tying more and more, then I felt this, that it is actually a connection with me and my body through rope. And then I could share it with others. So people are a little bit more connected to themselves so they can connect to others more. I feel that that was uh, what, made me teach it more and share this concept of rope as a connection tool. I could I could see where it could where it could serve like both both purposes, right? So this this very contemplative yogic experience and then an extension of intimacy that could be also very pleasurable and you know for the participants. So do you have clients that come to you that want the the sexual part of it or I to be have, able to some people that ask me about the how do I use the rope in the sexual uh, mm -hmm. context and I could show them the knots because these are absolutely the same knots that you same use knots. different <laughs> things right but I can't tell them exactly what they're doing but again one of my teachers is the uh, he uses rope as a tool of 
tying for sexual purposes. And he makes amazing performances in Japan. His name is Maruku Nawa. He made the books, uh, Japanese Rope Kama Sutra. And I yes. always recommend those books to people. So uh, they can learn simple knots, but then they can use the books to get inspired and to see what they can do exactly with ropes. Yeah, it's like more than a hundred things in there. So it's, it's a lot of things that you can do. <laughs> You'll have, yeah. you'll have your evening full right <laughs> yeah so it's like if people come to me with something that i don't know i usually know who to refer them to you know? right because right. i will not try to explain to them what i don't know for sure <laughs> mm -hmm. so are more people coming to you for the sexual aspect that experience or is it more for photography or for meditation and yoga more people come for um for to learn how to tie uh, mm -hmm. for more of um, I'd say meditational aspect of it because they if they know a little bit about me they would probably not really ask about the sexual things that much right. but at the same time it's the same knots so we can do I can still explain to them a little bit of it but not much so what people, is it, what's the distinction there is it where the knot is placed that makes it sexual like what is no, so uh, it's the intention of the knot. Because, for example, when you tie the open position like this, right, with arms in the back, we call that one uh, bunny ears. If you do this for just the beauty of that or for, again, a little stretching <laughs> or just feeling exposed, that doesn't have to be sexual. But it right. easily could be because you can continue the knot you can tie a little bit of like a bra support in the front and it we it is going to squeeze the breasts and give this person a feeling of exposure even more and they might get aroused from that and gotcha. you can do a lot of touching so this is all about the intention so you can tie one knot but the question there is how you're going to use it <laughs> right so are you naked when you do this? You don't have to be. Of course, if you're using it for sexual purposes, you probably are naked. But mm -hmm. for the just uh, how like I teach and what we do, no, never naked. <laughs> yeah. So and even the photography that you do, people are clothed. Usually they're clothed. I do have a couple of photo sessions that were nude but still mostly the like intimate parts were covered with rope mm -hmm. yeah because it's more like a fine art photography still even if it's nude i'm trying to yes. keep it safe. Very, yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. and is the are the ropes special kind of rope yeah ropes are a uh, jute rope it's a tra traditional japanese rope for tying is jute it's um the length, though, differs from person to person. Sometimes you use, the normal one is eight meters long, but some people use six meters, some people use 10 meters. That depends on how how um, wide your arms go or how small right. person you tie is. It also depends who prefers what. So there's not really like you only tie with eight meters. You, you can switch. And uh, there are many, many other materials, though. And people are usually very, like, they try different ones and they decide what they like more. For example, for me, jute is my favorite, but I also use posh rope. It's a synthetic version of jute. It's mm -hmm. great. It's It has more strength and it's actually way, um, way softer than jute because some people don't really like the feeling of jute that much on the body. It also gives irritations to some people. Um, but posh, no irritations, never. So this is why I like that. But yeah, there's many, many types of ropes that people can try and choose their own. And what advice? Yeah, go, go for ahead. It. No, go ahead, Dr. Frankie. Where where do they get this rope? Do you have to special order it? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. So uh you could get rope on like Amazon, but it's not going to be great, most likely. Uh last time I ordered rope on Amazon was two years ago and it was very bad, unfortunately. 
but if you order from the specialized like shibari rope store then it's going to be most likely very good because those people who sell the specialized shibari ropes they uh, treat them and treating of the rope is quite a long process you have to uh, make it not fluffy you have to burn it then you have to oil it some people even put beeswax on it or mm -hmm. some people are vegan so they don't use beeswax they use something else so there is even vegan rope so you can find rope of any kind wow yeah. this is like yeah a new, a new world right yeah. so what advice would you give someone that was interested in learning about shibari like where do they start I think that, first of all, they should try to find uh, a local teacher in their area so they can try <laughs> they can try with a real class. Because the best thing that you can do is try it real life, yes? But if they can't, and if especially they want to learn the very, very basics and they want to do it on their own, I could recommend my online course for beginners, of course. I have that and that can be done on your own uh, with this one rope and will give you the basics to go and continue studying with uh, anybody else. So, yeah, it's very good. I laughed because I thought that's what you were going to say. I thought you were going to say, come yeah. to Mexico. and. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would love everybody to come to Mexico and experience one of my retreats, but I know that that's not, that's not always an option for everybody, yeah. And how many people attend the retreats on average? I have a maximum of 14 people per retreat because I, I always also invite two more teachers so we, have, uh, so we can actually see what people do and give them the best support while they yeah. are here. But if it's just me, like six people max, I had uh, last year, I had two retreats. One was only for six people because it was only me. And another was for 14 and there was three teachers. So, yeah. Yeah. And is it a weekend, a week? That's uh, five days. So wow. five days. And uh, yeah, it's about like 14 hours or 15 hours of tying. Um, but we take breaks, of course, and we put in some more activities that are, for example, you go to swim in a beautiful cenote to explore a little bit of this area, because this is what they do when they come to um, Rivera Maya here. And uh, then we have a, a trip to the animal rescue. It's, okay. really, it's like a highlight of the trip for everybody. They love seeing <laughs> the monkeys, the parrots, and the animals that the rescue helps. It's mm -hmm. great. I, I love seeing the, their faces when they come back so like excited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, seeing that. Wow, what a job. What a cool job. <laughs> what a cool, right? Yeah. yeah. Also, so I find five days. Yeah, but in this five days, we really get to experience experience a lot it's not just dying I feel that coming to Mexico and just dying is not really worth it I mean yeah mm -hmm. I love shibari but if you're in Mexico you're gonna experience Mexico and I gotta give it to you so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do the, the cow ceremonies the sound healings with the locals oh, beautiful. Yeah. that gives people a very good feeling so we try to just get more of the feeling you know it's shibari and all of these practices should be helpful. <laughs> and how did you end up there, deciding to have, build your practice there? Uh, well, uh, that was actually quite a quite an accident. <laughs> um, me and my husband were traveling. We were nomadic for about three years, and then COVID happened. So we couldn't be in Russia. We couldn't really be in the U.S. for a long time. So we decided to come to Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. It was convenient for both of us. And uh, it was really nice here. Like, we never thought that we we're going to end up living on the beach. But now we are. And um, I built my practice here because there was one excited man that told me that we have enough people here to have weekly shibari classes. And I was like, I don't think so. It's a tiny village. But then he was like, no, we have enough. And we started actually doing them every week. And they were attracting more people. 
uh, which I really didn't think that that's going to happen. But this is how it grew, just because of one excited guy that wow. wanted to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. So it's a that's business terrific. that you and your husband run together. Uh, this is, uh, so Voodoo Ropes is, yeah, this is uh, my face, but my husband is behind the website, behind a lot of the technical stuff is my husband, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, organizing and uh, all the lessons, the videos, that's all me. <laughs> Got it. Wonderful. This is so good. <laughs> yeah. So how can folks find you if they're interested in exploring yeah, they can um, just uh, put in Google Voodoo Ropes. Uh, and Voodoo is spelled a little bit weirdly. It's V-O-U-D-O-U -O -U and Ropes. And I'm going to come up and folks can text me on Instagram or email me through the website. Yeah, it's very easy to find me. <laughs> Excellent. It's such a pleasure to have you on and, and learn for me, this is all, you know, I know about, you know, I've heard through the years through the BDSM community, um, a bit about ropes and things like that, but not, um, not this type exactly. So thank you for sharing your, Absolutely. your wisdom with us. Yeah. 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 Thank you for right. having me. I was glad to share. <laughs> All right, everyone, if you want to learn more about it, just all the notes will be below. And um, thanks so much for tuning in. Big hugs, kisses, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.